I recently stumbled on this integral and I really enjoy it. And I'm gonna do a video here where I solve it using three different methods. But before I do it, I encourage you to pause and take a stab at the integral yourself. See what kind of methods you can find. There's a lot of them. Now, for the first method, I'm gonna do the approach that I think is maybe most natural to someone who just like finished their standard first year calculus course. And that is to focus on that one plus x squared that's in the denominator. And the reason for that is it screams out trigonometric substitutions. If there's anything a calculus student should know, it's that there's these three trig identities. Sine squared plus cos squared is one. If you divide the top and the bottom by cos squared, you get tan squared plus one is equal to secant squared. And if instead you divided by sine squared, you'd get one plus cotangent squared is cosecant squared. These are always in my toolbox, and it kind of looks like it's actually the middle of those that lines up with the idea of one plus x squared. I will set x equals to tan theta. So I, I plug tan in everywhere here. Don't forget your dx has to change. If derivative of tan is secant squared. Don't forget your limits of integration have to change. But my focus is on that denominator. This is the whole reason for doing this. One plus tan squared, I now use that Pythagorean identity. This is nothing but secant squared. Now the secant squares cancel, and it simplifies out really nicely. Okay, so you might have tried this and you get to here, but then get a little bit stuck because logarithm of one plus tangent of theta, it's, it's not obvious how we can manipulate it. Maybe I can make it sine over cos instead, that'd be fine, but it's not quite clear what to do. Now, I know that I would like to use a trig identity somehow to clean this up, but I can't quite introduce a trig identity yet. So a great trick when doing integrals is to try the integral from the other side. What I mean by that is the following property. It says if you're integrating from point zero up to a, you could always integrate instead of f of x, f of a minus x. Visually, the reason for this property is that, you know how an integral is like an area under a curve and you can think of adding up a bunch of rectangles from left to right as an approximation? But if you added the areas of the rectangles from right to left instead, that'd give you the same area. And, and so we have this identity. Okay, so applying the identity instead of tangent of theta, what I'm gonna get is tangent of pi over four minus theta. Now, the reason why I did this is that now I have some messiness inside of the tangent and I can actually use some trig identities. Like one of the trig identities that's gonna be helpful here is the tangent of a minus b. This is pi over four minus theta, so I can use a trig identity. And I don't normally have these memorized, but I know that there's trig identities for like sine of a plus b, sine of a minus b, cos of a plus b, cos of a minus b, and the same for tangent. But regardless, if I plug this in, that tangent of pi over four minus theta is gonna become initially quite messy, but tangent of pi over four is just one, so that's gonna clean up a lot. And then I wanna find some common denominators here, so I'm gonna put that one plus tangent of theta on the bottom of both sides. I notice I have a lot of nice canceling on the top here, and this leaves me with the vastly simplified two over one plus tan theta. But Trevor, isn't this just as hard as the original? Like you started with logarithm one plus tan theta, now you have a one plus tan theta on the bottom. It doesn't seem like you've helped much, but I have. Anytime you're doing integrals and you get two integrals that are very similar to each other, but represent the same number i, then maybe you can do some sort of cancellation. So for example, what if I try adding these together? If I do that, it cleans up incredibly nicely. And this is because the sum of two logarithms is the logarithm of the product. So the one plus tangent of theta on the top and the one plus tan theta on the bottom, they cancel. All that's left over is now the logarithm of the two. So the fact that I had these two different expressions that had a lot of similarity allowed for this cancellation. And then this is just a constant, you get the value, divide out by the two, and i is pi times logarithm of two divided by eight. But that was just method one. Now let's try method two, which is a completely different style of trickery. So, okay, back to where we began. When I look at this, one of the things that I think about is that the denominator, as we saw before, the one plus x squared, I sort of know what to do with that. It's the numerator, the logarithm of one plus x part that's kind of hard. What my trick is gonna be, is gonna take this single integral and turn it into a double integral. And those of you who have seen my multivariable calculus playlist will know that there's a ton of tricks that we can do when we have a double integral that aren't accessible to us for a single integral. So specifically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to take that logarithm and see, can I write the logarithm as an integral with respect to something else, some other variable like y? 
and you can play around with different possibilities, but this is at least one way to do it. This function of x, log of 1 plus x, is now an integral with respect to y. Uh, just to see this, if you don't believe me, you can make a u substitution on the bottom, and then when you integrate it out, you get du over u, that will integrate to the logarithm, and we'll get logarithm 1 plus x. So here I've taken a portion of the inside of this logarithm and rewritten it as an integral in terms of y. Okay, let's go and shove what I just computed back in. So now I have a double integral, that's an inner integral with respect to y, and then an outer integral with respect to x. Okay, so now we get to use the trickery of double integrals. One of the great things is a theorem called Fubini. And what Fubini does is it allows me to interchange integrals with respect to x and integrals with respect to y. I can do them in the other order. Visually, if I have a surface, then I can imagine doing one order is taking a particular type of slices, that's one integral, and then adding up all the slices. And that would be the same volume under the surface as slicing in the opposite direction first and then adding up all of these opposite slices. This works when my function is continuous and our function is continuous here. And so I'm allowed to do this change of order. The debate now is, is this integral easier to do than the old one was? Has changing the order made things simpler? And indeed it has. Now this integrand is an algebraic expression. And uh, I can do a bunch of algebra to that algebraic expression. So let's just do a, a quick little bit of algebra. I'm going to do it very fast. Whenever I look at this, I notice that it is a product on the bottom of a linear term and a quadratic, and that should scream partial fractions. Okay, so I'm going to speed run through this partial fractions. What you try to do is you try to guess it as an a over the linear and a bx plus c over the quadratic. I can multiply it by the denominator on both sides, and I get a system of equations. I get the coefficients of 1, the coefficients of x, the coefficient of an x squared. It's a system of equations. You can go and solve them if you wish, uh, but I'll put up the answers. I have an a and a b and a c. They're just three things in terms of y. So plug in those a, b, c in, I get this expression. So that's just some algebra I can do. It just turns out there was nice algebra that I'm allowed to do on this integrand after these substitutions have been made. So if I go back to the original, remember what I was trying to do? I was taking the double integral of this. So now that I've done the algebra, I can just take that inside and I can change it by the algebra that we've just done. The question is, is this integral now easier now that I've done this algebra? Well, it is. The first thing I notice is that the inner integral is in terms of x, but I've got this 1 over 1 plus y squared. That's just entirely in terms of y. I can move it outside of the integral respect to x. I, I don't need to deal with it right now. I'll deal with that later. Now I'm going to focus on the inner integral. Okay, so the first thing I need to deal with is this negative y over 1 plus xy. I'm doing an integral respect to x, so y is just a constant here. So just imagine it's like 1 plus 3x or something. Okay, well I just do a u sub. u is 1 plus xy, this is going to be a du over u, and what do I get? I get an arctan out of it, with a negative sign, if I had a negative sign from where I started. Next one is x over 1 plus x squared, a very easy u substitution for my calculus students to do. Uh, and if I plug this in, I get another logarithm, logarithm 2 over 2. And then the final one to do is y over 1 plus x squared. Now, again, y is a constant when I'm integrating with respect to x, like 3 over 1 plus x squared. Okay, something over 1 plus x squared, that integral is arctan, kind of know that one, one of your, the most important ones, integral of 1 over x squared being arctan. Uh, the y comes along for the ride, evaluated at 1, you just get the value of pi over 4. Evaluated at 0, you get 0. So this is y pi over 4. Okay, so I've done the inner integral, right? Plug all those three things in, and, and now I have this expression. Now I have to do the outer integral. Is that going to be easier? Well, it turns out yes. Again, three terms here. First term, does this look familiar to you? I mean, there's y's everywhere here, but remember how we started? It was logarithm of 1 plus x over 1 plus x squared. It's the same thing, it's just colored y as opposed to the colored x now. The choice of symbol is different, but the evaluation of the integrals mean the same thing. So this is just negative i because there's that negative term. Whatever the initial integral is, this is just the negative of it. Then I have two other terms. They're both going to be straightforward. Uh, again, I have a constant and then 1 over y squared. That's going to be one of those arctans again. So I get a value logarithm 2 uh, divided by 2 times pi over 4. And then the final term here, okay, so this is a y over 1 plus y squared with some constants u is 1 plus y squared, we get uh, 1 over u, this is going to give me a logarithm 2 over 2 times pi over 4, uh, the same thing. All right, so I got my three pieces that I have now computed, so i is negative i plus all this other mess. I can move the negative i to the other side, clean it all up, and what do I get? i is logarithm 2 times pi divided by 8, the same answer as before. So this sort of shows the power of taking a single integral and making it into a double integral. All right. 
Third method for solving this particular integral, this is called Feynman's trick. I've done a couple of videos before on Feynman's trick. I, I really think it's a, a super powered uh, integral uh, technique. Basically the idea is I here is a number, whatever this is, it's some number, right? But I could introduce a parameter a and make this now a function of that parameter a. So our goal is i of 1. But I'm going to actually solve what superficially seems like the harder problem, i of a, which is this whole family of things. And if using that I'm able to get to i of 1, then, then great. So initially the problem seems harder, but I'll show you why it actually makes it a bit easier in a moment. There's lots of places where you could put that parameter, but the logarithm, that was the hard spot in my integral, so I think it makes sense here. It's a reasonable guess. Now, the way Feynman's trick works is the first thing that you do is you take the derivative with respect to a, with respect to the new parameter. My integral is in terms of x, but I'm taking the derivative inside the integral, and well, what is logarithm of 1 plus a over x? It goes to 1 over 1 plus ax. I'm taking the derivative with respect to a, so by chain rule I spit out an x on the top. So this is i prime of a. Great. Actually, you might recognize that. It looks kind of similar to the old trick. But let's keep on going. The way Feynman's trick then works says, okay, I've got this result, i prime of a, whatever it is, it's just some function of a. Right? The x's will be integrated out, it'll be a function of a. So if I want to get to i of 1, I need to integrate with respect to a. So my plan is, whatever that thing is, I could do that integral. I'm then going to integrate it, integrate the i prime, and by a fundamental theorem of calculus, this will give you i of 1, that's the thing I want, minus i of 0, and i of 0 here is just 0, right? If I plug a equal to 0 into the original expression, you get logarithm of 1, which is 0. So basically the hope is that by taking the derivative and then the integral, I get to what I want, but somehow by taking the derivative first, it's going to make that integral with respect to x easier to evaluate. Okay? So if I do that, I get this expression, and Alarm bell should be going off everywhere. We've seen this. This was exactly the integral that we got in the second method. The only difference was I called the new thing y back then for when I was more explicitly trying to add in a, a second dimension. Here I added the parameter, so I call it an a, but it's the same integral. If a is equal to y, it's exactly what we got before. So I don't need to repeat that. I get the same value, logarithm 2 times pi divided by 8. Actually, I would say that this Feynman trick maybe even gives the motivation for the specific choice of introducing a second variable that we did in the second method. All right, so there was three different methods to solve this integral. If you have a completely different method, I'd love to hear it. Uh, put it down in the comments. I would like to see that. There is definitely more than the three I've done, but I hope you enjoyed this very relaxing integral, and we'll do some more math in the next video.